Good evening, everyone. If you would, take your Bible and open it to the book of Ephesians. The book of Ephesians. I am delighted to be with you all. I am grateful to be back in the town that raised me um, many years ago. I realized as I was on my way over here that I have now lived longer outside of Indiana than uh, in Indiana for the first time in my life. Um, now at age 36, almost 37, after spending 18 years here, I've spent 18 years away, um, going on 19. Um, but it's good to be back. Uh, I always miss Indiana, and I don't always recognize it until I come back and then remember what it smelled like here, what it sounds like here. Um, a, a bit calmer than life in Brooklyn, for sure. Um, and we're grateful to be here. Uh, grateful to be able to bring my wife and kids uh, to be able to to be here and spend the week with you all. Uh, my mom was reminding me that uh, I think this is the first time my family's ever been in Indiana in the fall um, and uh, truly a beautiful time. And But I'm especially grateful for them to get to meet people who've been important to me. And uh, many of you have encouraged me in younger years and strengthened me in the Lord, uh, taught me to love the Lord and have been seeking the Lord since I was very young, uh, or even longer than that. Uh, and I'm thankful for your faith and your love. It's really a blessing to be with you. We're grateful for all of you uh, who have already invited us over to eat uh, or just to provide for us in different ways or encouraged us. And I'm really grateful for your presence. Um, thankful that we can open up God's word. I, I, I was thinking about this on the way over here. I don't think most of you would be interested in hearing me talk unless it was about the Word of God. It is the Word of God that makes all that we do here valuable. It is God and His Word which gives us meaning and gives us life, um, and that's what unites us together. And so we want to open up His Word over the course of this weekend together and see what we can learn from it. We're going to read this uh, weekend primarily from the book of Ephesians. We're going to spend most of our time there. Uh, I heard that many of you have been already spent some time there this year, um, and so hopefully this will uh, reinforce some of the things that you've learned, strengthen you, encourage you, and hopefully provo provoke you to keep learning. One of the things that's amazing about the Bible, the Bible is like a mine, um, and the, 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 the deeper that you dig, the more that you see of God's treasure. And that's true for me just this week, reading Ephesians again. I'm noticing things I've never really noticed before, uh, though I've read this book many, many times over. And so we'll try to explore it together. Hopefully I'll provoke you to want to spend more time in God's Word, but I, I ask you to open up the Word of God and read it with us as we, uh, as we read tonight um, and discuss it together. So we're going to begin in Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to read the first two verses, and then I want to make a few introductory comments before we uh, get into tonight's lesson. Ephesians begins this way, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is, a, uh, this is a very powerful letter. Um, it, Paul does a lot in this letter. Um, and uh, as you guys know, Paul wrote a big portion of the New Testament. Um, but this letter in particular um, covers a lot of ground. Um, in New York City, um, there's a place that uh, a new recent skyscraper that they built um, called The Edge. I am not a fan of heights. I have no interest in going anywhere high, especially after September 11th. I have no interest in being in any tall buildings, but I have a friend who loves to persecute me. And so for my birthday, he got me and my wife tickets uh, to the edge. And he said, I've already paid for it. It's expensive to do. So you guys are going. Uh, and so we did. Um, this is the first outdoor skyscraper in New York City where you go up to the top of it, and then you go on an outdoor deck. And actually, you go out there, and part of the floor is glass, and it's clear. So you can just look down and see the street far below. It's extremely popular. People love to go there and, and on this outdoor deck because it gives you a view of the whole city. And you can see out over the river. You can see all over Manhattan. You can see all the way down to Brooklyn, where we live. Uh, far off in different directions. What I think Paul does in this 
relatively short letter is he gives us that kind of view of God. Uh, he gives us a, a, a bird's eye view of what is happening in the world, what is happening not just in the world, but in the spiritual realm. He'll, you, there's a phrase that's used here again and again, the heavenly realms or the heavenly places throughout the book of Ephesians, uh, only used in this letter, uh, if I remember right. Um, and, and yet it's giving us a view into the world and the, the, the spiritual realm around us. Ephesians teaches us deep things about God, about Jesus, about the Holy Spirit. It teaches us about salvation. It teaches us about the church and about relationships and how to have healthy relationships and what our relationships should be like in this world. It teaches us about marriage and family. And it teaches us about spiritual warfare. There's just a, a whole host of topics here. And so I think this, this letter is helpful for us to look at as we try to figure out who we are in this world and what is our purpose and what are, what are we really here for um, on this earth. So with that in mind, I'd like for us to look at uh, our topic tonight, which is um, God has a dream. God has a dream. And I want you to think about this, this truth as we begin. Um, and we're going to read in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. There's a, there, there's a version of this, reading this letter, um, that can become, especially in our culture, uh, very self-absorbed. Where we can look at this and say, and say, wow, look at all that God is doing for me. And this is all about me. Uh, we, you've probably heard of the speech that Martin Luther King Jr. gave. I have a dream, one of the most powerful speeches given in our nation's history. Um, but I, it dawned on me a few years ago, reading the book of Ephesians, as I read passages like what we're about to read in Ephesians chapter 1, um, that, that this is not just about our dream. That what God is up to is something way greater than anything we could imagine in this world, that what God is trying to accomplish is something far beyond anything I could think up or any of us could imagine in our minds. God has a dream, and that's what we want to explore. The first three chapters of the book of Ephesians especially show us God's dream for his people, God's calling that he has for his people. And then the last three chapters show us how to walk worthy of that calling. They show us how to walk in a way that honors or, or reveres God and, get, and, and, and brings about the fulfillment of his dream. And so the first uh, three nights here, we're going to look at uh, Ephesians, the first three chapters, and we're going to try to explore portions of them. I, I can't promise you we'll give equal attention to every verse, but we're going to try to explore portions of this, this first half to get a glimpse of God's calling. And I'll tell you why I think this is important. I don't know about you, but uh, growing up, I read the Bible um, a lot, and uh, I, I, I was taught by my parents to love God's Word and to read God's Word carefully. Um, but there were certain parts of the Word of God that were hard for me. Uh, I came to passages like Ephesians 4, which would say things like, do this and don't do this and do this and don't do this. And I don't know if you've ever felt this way, but at times I, I found the Bible to be somewhat burdensome. Like, look at all these commands. Look at all these laws. Look at all these ways in which God is calling us to live. Look, look at all these ways in which God is restricting maybe the way I'd like to live. Um, look at all these ways in which God is asking me to do things that are not comfortable or not easy for me. Um, but I think one of the reasons why I felt that way is because I didn't really understand what exactly God's calling was. And what I think Paul is doing in the first half of this book is he's showing us what exactly is God up to in the spiritual realms? What is God trying to accomplish? And where and how do we fit in to God's great plan? And so as we read these verses, I want you to see if you can get a glimpse just from the reading uh, of what it is that God is up to. And we'll try to explore some of that. Let's read Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 3 and we're going to read down through verse 14. I'm reading from the English Standard Version tonight, um, but Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Listen to what he says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless. Before him. 
In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed, which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ, as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him, who works all things according to the counsel of his will so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. This is the word of the Lord. I want you to think a little bit about what um, Paul is saying here. Paul begins this letter overflowing in worship. I mean, that's really the only way to describe it. I mean, he begins by blessing God because God has blessed us. And I just want you to notice this. Right here at the beginning of this letter, Paul is teaching us something about God's dream. God's dream is to bless us. God's dream is to bless us. I think that's important for us to recognize. I don't know what your, your experience was like growing up. I don't know what your view of God has been. Um, but I'll tell you, there are a lot of people whose view of God is God's dream is to curse us. That's the way they think about it. God is always angry. He's always desiring to hurt. Um, they read stories like uh, Noah's Ark and they like, wow, look at God. Look at how awful he is. He just, he just destroyed the whole world. Look at how he just wiped everyone out. Uh, and some people have a view of God that is that way, that God is out to get me. God is out to hurt me. God is always looking for me to make a mistake so that he can punish me. But that is not the biblical view of God. God's dream has always been to bless us. God's desire has always been to give good gifts to his children. Unfortunately, though, I think sometimes we, uh, we look for God's blessing in the wrong places. We want God to bless us financially. We want God to bless us uh, with help. We want God to bless us with riches or, or with honor or with um, a good reputation or with some of these things. And we forget where God's blessings come. Did you notice a phrase that's repeated again and again and again? and again, and again, and again, in this text that we just read. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ. In Christ. You'll notice it in verse 3. You'll notice it in verse 4. You'll notice it in verse 5, in verse 6, in verse 7, in verse 9, in verse 11, in verse 12, in verse 13, and in verse, and in, at, again at the end of verse 13. This phrase, in Christ in him. How does God bless us? Certainly God blesses us in many ways. God blesses us with rain, and that rain falls upon the just and the unjust, the Bible says, Jesus said. But the greatest blessing that God can give us is all wrapped up in Christ. How does God bless us? God's dream is to bless us in Christ. And I don't know all that Paul has in mind when he uses that phrase again and again. I'm not sure I fully grasp everything that Paul wants us to wrap our minds around. But I just want to share a few things on this because I think this is really important to understanding everything else in the letter uh, of Ephesians. When Paul, whenever you see something in the Bible that gets repeated again and again and again, it's because it's important. It's because it's important. And this is important. God's dream is to bless us in Christ Jesus. Well, what does that mean? Well, at least that means, first of all, that, that actually the way God blesses us is through Christ Jesus 
and through what Christ Jesus has done for us. He's blessed us in Christ, verse 3. Verse 4, he chose us in him. Verse 5, he predestined us as sons through Jesus Christ. Verse 6, he has freely given us his grace in Christ, in the beloved. In verse 7, in him we have redemption. Verse 9, uh, he, has, he has according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ. He's given us his plan in Christ. Verse 10, he's uniting all things in Christ. Verse 11, we have obtained an inheritance in Christ. Verse 12, we who were first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And verse 13, in him, you also, when you heard of the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Do you notice here what, what Paul is emphasizing? That God is blessing us through what Christ has done and through what Christ has accomplished. What Jesus has accomplished when he left heaven and came down here to earth is the source of every spiritual blessing that we have. Every blessing comes through Christ Jesus. And so by us being in Christ Jesus, we get to experience God's dream, which is to bless us in Christ. By us being in Christ Jesus, we get to experience all the gifts that God has in store for his people. Think about the beauty of that. Uh, to, to just appreciate this idea of being, us being in Christ Jesus. Think of what, what, what happens when a person is united uh, and I think that's the idea here. To be in Christ is to be united with Christ in him. Uh, what happens when a person gets married? You know, you can be a really poor person. But if you marry someone who's really rich, as soon as you're married, you ain't poor anymore. Legally, you are now rich. Everything that they had is yours. You could be a very uh, rich person. But if you marry someone who's poor, or in deep debt. As soon as you get married, you could have debt. You could go from being rich to having debt because legally you are united with that person. And so everything that they have is yours and everything that you have is theirs. There's a unity. Do you know that when we become part of Christ, when we are now in Christ, everything that he has is ours. God's desire is to bless us in Christ Jesus, by sharing everything that Christ has accomplished with us. Think about the story of David and Goliath. Do you remember when David killed Goliath? All of the blessings that came from that were not just for David to enjoy, but also for all Israel. All Israel was united with David in sharing in the blessings. And this is the amazing thing about Christ Jesus. What he did was far greater than slaying Goliath. He slew the greater Goliath our sins, when he suffered and died on the cross, what did Jesus do? He redeemed us by his grace. He redeemed us. What does he say in verse 7? In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Isn't that a blessing? To know that all of our sins, all of our trespasses are washed away. I don't know how long you've been in the Lord. I don't know how long you've been seeking God. But I, I think what happens over time, the longer we serve God, the longer we seek him, sometimes the easier it is to forget where we came from. The easier it is to forget who we used to be, how much the Lord had against us. Do you remember your sins? Do you remember the times where you failed the Lord? Do you remember the times where you rebelled against his way? Do you remember the times where you disobeyed him? where you chose to do the opposite of what he desired. How amazing is it that in Christ we have been redeemed? Do you remember what it was like to be enslaved to sin? Do you remember what it was like to be stuck in your sin? To feel like I, even though you want to get out, even though you want to stop doing it, it just feels like you keep making the same mistakes over and over and over again. How great is it to, feel, to realize that we have been redeemed. When I moved to New York, there were a few things that were difficult for me um, about the transition. One of them was uh, learning to park well. Um, and so one uh, 
Thursday morning, I think it was, we were going to do some, uh, some outreach. We were passing out some flyers, inviting people to a series of Bible studies um, at Columbia University. And uh, I parked on the street. I went off. We'd, we'd um, passing out uh, flyers to people there on campus. I don't think one person spoke to me in the entire time. I, I, I do that in the Bronx. I do that in Brooklyn. And we'll talk. We have lots of people um, that I'll talk to and get conversations with. But at Columbia University, a very prestigious school where people are very wealthy and very smart, I don't think anybody acknowledged even our presence for that entire hour. But so I, I was leaving that place discouraged. I was leaving that place embarrassed, um, having spent an hour and feeling like nobody even acknowledges your existence. You're leaving feeling pretty low. But it, things went from bad to worse when I got back to where I had parked, and there goes my car. There's a tow truck carrying my car. And I see my brother-in-law, some of you know Roger Polanco, um, who, who, who brought me there, chasing my car down the street, yelling at the tow truck driver to, to wait and to give us the car back. Unfortunately, the guy didn't listen, and I had to follow him, ride with my brother-in-law, and that drive of shame all the way down to the tow yard. Um, but it's weird what I found when I got there. Um, you get to the tow, tow yard, uh, and they actually have a sign. Uh, I don't know if they still have the sign, but they actually have a sign in the tow yards that says, Redemption Center. And I'm thinking, Redemption Center? What is getting redeemed? Uh, you know? But this is what happens. You go in there, and you pay the $400 or whatever for the fine or whatever. You pay the ransom note, and what do they give you? They stamp it. They say, hey, redeemed. You get your car back. Um, you bought it back. It was taken away. Now you have, you, it's been returned. Do you realize that if you are in Christ, that's exactly what's happened for you? You were in captivity. Just like my car was in captivity, you were in captivity of a much more serious nature. Captivity to sin. Captivity that ends in death. The wages of sin are death. How incredible is it? How, what does it tell us about God? That God loves us so much. That his dream is so serious. That he wants to bless us so much. That he sent Jesus, left heaven, to come down to a place way worse than a tow yard. To come down and suffer in a penalty way worse than $400 to pay the price with the precious blood, his own precious blood, so that we could have redemption, the forgiveness of sin, so that we could be set free from that captivity. God has a dream, and that dream is to bless us. If we had the time, I would spend the rest of our time just looking at each one of these phrases in verses 3 through 14. Every one of them is worth some serious meditation. And I'll encourage you to continue to meditate upon them. But let me just tell you that the, God's dream doesn't end here. God's dream is to bless us in Christ Jesus. But let me add a second part to this. God has a dream to bless us so that we may become a blessing. God has a dream to bless us so that we may become a blessing. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, and I want to read beginning in verse 1. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he's loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your doing. It's the gift of God. Not as a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk. There's so much in this text. And some of it we'll come back to a little later in the week. 
but I, um, but 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 there, I want us to really focus in here on what Paul is saying. We were dead in our sins. God raised us up and made us alive. When we were dead, God resurrected us and gave us life. But why? Why did God? resurrect us why did god give us life was it so that we could show and prove our own goodness to the world no it was not in fact he says it was not a result of works so that no one may boast it is not so that we can prove our goodness that god raised us up but rather it is as the song says may i still thy goodness prove it is to prove god's goodness that god raised us up and therefore we are his workmanship some versions there say we are his masterpiece have you thought about that i don't know if you're into music some of you guys may be uh, talented musicians. I am not. I love music. I'm not good at playing it. I love to sing. I love to listen to it. Um, but I have very little talent on that. But, you know, uh, musicians, they all have their masterpiece. That, 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 that song that they play or that song that they sing that really just shows their glory or their beauty. And when you hear it, you're amazed by it. And you're reminded of the beauty of this musician, how talented they are, how gifted they are. Or how about artists? Uh, Lindsay and I, I've never really been into art, never really uh, understood the why art is so special. But Lindsay and I um, are blessed to, uh, God willing, take a trip uh, to Italy next week. And we're going to uh, stop in a place called Florence. And people are telling me all these things about all these different art things you got to see there and stuff. And, and, and none of it really makes much sense to me. But, but I have been in places before, a couple of times gone into the Met in, uh, in New York City and seen a few paintings that really touch me. And you see it, and you see the beauty and the intricacies of, of what is made there, and you're like, wow, look, somebody made this. And the, the masterpiece shows you the greatness and the glory of the artist, the person who made it. What is God's masterpiece? What is God's workmanship that is put on display to show how good, how great, how amazing he is? God is the artist, and we are the art. God is the artist, and we are the art that's put on display in this world to show how great God is. How do we do that? We are his workmanship, the text says, created in Christ Jesus for good works. We are not a masterpiece that is just meant to sit there and, you know, look at how beautiful that person is. Look at how great that person is. How do we show God's glory, God's beauty to the world around us? It's through doing good works. It's through doing good works. One of my favorite um, descriptions of Jesus comes when, Paul, when Peter was talking to Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. And he summarized Jesus' life this way. He said, he, you know how he went about doing good and healing all those uh, who were under the power of the devil, for God was with them. I thought, that, isn't that a great summary? You know about Jesus, how he went about doing good and healing everybody under the devil's power. Do you know that's what we're supposed to be doing as the people of God? As the people of God, just as God was with Jesus, we now who are in Christ, God is with us. He has sealed us with his Holy Spirit. Therefore, we are his workers who are to go about doing good and healing those who are under the power of the devil. Let me ask you, how are you doing it? Would people around you say that your life is filled with good works? Do people look at the way you conduct yourself on the job, in your neighborhood, in your interactions with people around you, and they say, wow, look at what God is doing through this sister. Look at what God is doing through this brother. We are created by God, not just so that he may bless us, but so that we may become a blessing. And what this means for us is that we've got to be willing to, uh, to break out of our uh, comfortable spaces and comfortable shells. We've got to be willing to do things that may not come naturally to us in order to be rich in good works. God desires for us to be rich in good works. Do you remember that that's the instruction that Paul gave to Timothy for how to instruct the rich people? 
He said, actually, you know, riches are not inherently wrong, inherently sinful. He says, no, teach them not to put their trust in their riches, but rather to be rich in good works. And I'll tell you, all of us here living in the United States, all of us are rich. You want to compare us to people around the world? We are wealthy. We have food. If we have shelter, if we have those things, we are wealthy. What does God expect us to do with our wealth? He didn't just give it to us to enjoy he did give it to us to enjoy, but he gave it to us to enjoy so that we could be rich in good works. I want to challenge you on this. How are you doing at using what God has given you? When God gives us more than what we need, he doesn't give it to us simply so that we can enjoy it, but also so that we can share it with those who have less, so that we can provide for those who do not have what they need. God desires us. And God's dream has always been to bless us so that we may become a blessing. So how are we doing at fulfilling God's dream in this world? If Jesus went about doing good and he perfectly reflected the beauty of his creator, how am I doing at reflecting the image of God, the image of Christ in my life? The truth is that when sin entered the world, all of us who were made in the image of God fell short of God's glory and God's image. And we've been falling short. But the amazing thing that Paul is telling us here in Ephesians is that what God is doing is he's renewing us into the image of Christ again. God is changing us. He's making us what he desires us to be. God's dream is to bless us so that we may become a blessing. Even that, though, I don't think fully satisfies uh, what is God's dream in this world. God's dream is to bless us. His dream is to bless us so that we may become a blessing. But, you know, sometimes we can, we can bless. We can actually be a blessing to other people. We can serve. We can, we can do good things for others. But if people don't actually know why we're doing it, it actually doesn't bring glory to God. In fact, sometimes it may end up bringing glory not to God, but to ourselves. We can fall into this trap where we go about doing good, but we want to do it quietly and we don't want anybody to know because we don't want anybody to know that we're actually Christians because it's getting less and less popular. I know it's still somewhat popular, but it's getting less and less popular to be a Christian in the United States. So sometimes what we'd like to do is we're just going to be super quiet Christians. You know, we'll go around, we'll do good, we'll do our good works, we'll do it secretly and silently, but nobody else can find out who we are or, or what we believe or who we represent. If we are God's workmanship, then we represent him to the world. And so God has a dream to bless us that we may become a blessing and bless his glorious name. And bless his glorious name. What is everything that God has given us that we are using to be a blessing in this world? What is it all meant to do? It's meant to show God's glory and God's grace. Did you notice that in the reading in chapter 1 and verse 6? Why has God blessed us with all these spiritual blessings in the heavenly places? In verse 6, he says, to the praise of his glorious grace. To the praise of his glorious grace. And if you skip down to verse 12, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. And then again in verse 14, he's sealed us with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. Do you see that? It's being emphasized here again and again. Everything that God is blessing us with is meant for us to turn it back into a blessing to him. We bless God because he has blessed us. Everything we do is meant to bless God. His glorious name. And so again, I'll ask you, how are you doing at, in your life living as a blessing that brings people to bless His glorious name? Look at chapter 2 in verse 7 again. Why did God take us when we were dead in our sins and raise us up to walk in newness of life. Look at verse 7. He raised us up with him, seated us with him, verse 6, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. 
You see this here? God has a reason for resurrecting us and putting us on display and putting us in this world. God is actually trying to show something. Well, what is he trying to show? Verse 7, he's trying to show in the coming ages the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God is trying to show through us just how gracious and kind he really is. Does anybody in the world today question whether or not God is gracious and whether or not God is really kind? Do you know people who around you question whether or not God is really kind? Many people who have suffered in this world, who have experienced the pains of life in a broken world, look at all the hardships that happen and oftentimes bad things that happen to really good and godly people and, 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 and difficult things that people endure who, who, who we feel like should never have to endure that. And people shake their fists at God and they say, how could God? If there is a God, he's a monster. He's not a God who's good. He's not a God who's kind. He's not somebody who's, who loves and who wants to, to, wants to bless and who wants to care for his people. He's a God who lets evil go on. And a God like that can't be, can't be really God or he can't be good if he is God. How is God going to show the world in the ages to come the immeasurable riches of his kindness? How is God going to show the world that he truly is great in grace and in kindness? You know how he does it? He takes people like us, normal humans, broken by sin, enslaved to their own devices, dead in their trespasses and sin, and God raises them up and he makes them into new living creatures who represent him on earth, who go about doing good and healing others. And God puts them on display and says, here's the evidence that I really am good, that I really am kind. How important is that calling? How important is that calling? Have you thought about that? That you may be the evidence, your life may be the evidence that the people around you in your neighborhood and on your job and in, and in this city and in this town, that they may be looking to. You may be the evidence that God really is good and really is kind. What if I'm not actually going about doing good works? What if I'm not actually telling people about how good and kind God really is? Can you imagine? How do you think the Lord feels about that? Let me show you one more place. Look at chapter 3 and in verse 10. When Paul's talking in chapter 3 and in verse 10, he's talking about uh, his ministry in the gospel that God has given him uh, by his great power. And he says in verse 8, To me, though I am the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God, who created all things. Verse 10, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. You notice what he says in verse 10? What is God accomplishing through us? through the church that he's created? What is God trying to do by taking all these broken people who were dead in their sins and raising them up and putting them together in one family and uniting them all in Christ? What is God trying to accomplish? This is what he's trying to accomplish. He's trying to you through the church to show his manifold wisdom. Notice this, not just to the world, but to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Now, this is where Ephesians gets kind of weird, right? We don't like to think about the, the, the fact that there's a spiritual realm outside of what we can see and touch. But the Bible emphasizes this from cover to cover, that there is, in fact, a spiritual realm, that there are spiritual forces at work, that there are evil spirits that are at work trying to deceive people and trying to lead people away from God. And don't you know that even those in the spiritual realm, there are rulers and there are authorities that are questioning whether or not God is really wise. In fact, do you remember stories like this in the Bible? Do you guys remember the story of Job? What was going on in Job? 
a battle in the heavens. Satan says about Job, he only loves you because you bless him. You give him all these things. If you take it away, he's going to curse you and he's going to die. And God says, oh, really? We'll take it away and let's see what happens. Have you ever thought about that? That actually your life is a battleground for spiritual forces. That God could look at you and I and say, hey, here's proof that I am really manifoldly wise. Look at what I've done in this brother's life. Look at what I've done in this sister's life. Look at what I've done in the lives of my children. We have a job to do, not just in the world. We have a job to do even in the spiritual realms. God has put us on display as an opportunity to show his great manifold wisdom, even to the rulers and the authorities. I don't know about you, but something about what Paul is doing here in this letter helps me to think more seriously about my life. That really what I'm caught up in here is something way greater than me. Sometimes when I go out, it's hard to see the stars in New York. Um, every once in a while we can see one or two, um, but it's, it's not easy. But sometimes I come out to places like this and you just see, wow, there's no lights here. So you can just see everything. Like you can see stars everywhere. And you get, to, you get to view the world like that. You get to go to a place where, where you can see and, and you start to recognize I'm caught up in something that is far greater than myself. I'm just like a tiny speck on a tiny planet in a huge universe. That is helpful for us. And I want to leave you each night as we look at, uh, in each lesson as we look at these, I want to try to leave you with one thing that I want to encourage you to take away from this. Um, and think about trying to implement or to practice in your life. And, and tonight, what I want you to think about is this. If God has a dream, God's dream is to bless us so that we may become a blessing and bless his glorious name. Bring that blessing back to God to, to be to the praise of his glory. If that is God's dream, then what does that mean for me if I'm going to fulfill his dream? The question is not whether or not God's dream will be fulfilled. It certainly will. God's dream is going to be fulfilled. Here's the question, though. The question is, will God's dream be fulfilled in your life? We know it's going to be fulfilled in the lives of many. We know it's going to be fulfilled in the lives of his people. But will God's dream be fulfilled in your life and in my life? And I want to, and, and I want to challenge you on this. How much do you think about the heavenly realms. How much do you think about the spiritual forces that are at work in this world? How much do you think about the cosmic purpose and plan of God, which transcends far beyond any of my dreams, my plans, my purposes in this world? Many of us have dreams for our life. We have hopes. We have plans. We have things we'd like to accomplish, things that we'd like to do. But let me tell you that all of them pale in comparison with God's dream for us. To be a representative of God, to be royalty, to be part of God's household. You guys know the kind of obsessive, um, the kind of obsession that the world has with royalty. I mean, all you gotta do is just read the papers anytime there's news about the, uh, the royal family in England. I mean, they got Netflix series, they got all kinds of stuff that just comes out all the time. People are obsessed with how are the royals behaving, why? Because they're royalty, they're special. And so they're held to like a really high standard because they represent the king. They represent the king. You know what's amazing? We are God's children. We are adopted as sons. A lot of people read that and they're like, wow, look at the Bible is sexist. You know, the Bible is sexist. They're adopted as sons. Where, where's, where's women's place? Actually, the Bible here is showing how inclusive it is. When God says that we are all adopted as sons, what he's saying is that unlike the, the worlds around at that time where only males could receive an inheritance, in Christ we are all sons. That is male or female. We all receive God's inheritance. We are all representatives of the king of the universe. We are all sons and daughters of God. And therefore, we have a great job to do. So let me challenge you with this. Set your mind on things above. Do you remember Jesus saying, hey, 
Don't store up treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but store up treasures in heaven. Do you remember why he said that? For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I don't know about you. I'll just be honest with you. I think a big part of my struggles spiritually is rooted in this, that my eyes are too caught up in fleshly things. I think too much about this world. I think too much about what is right in front of me. And too often I am blind to the spiritual world around. My mind is not set on things above. And this is why Paul says in Colossians 3 and verse 1, set your mind on things above. Where Christ is. Christ is seated in the heavenly places with God. Notice though, Ephesians chapter 2 said that we too, when we were raised up with him, we are seated with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Do you think about your life that way? As being seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. If you thought about your life that way, would it change the way you live day by day? The way you act? The way you walk? The way you speak? This is my prayer. May God help us to visualize more each day. I'm not saying for a second that I think I fully grasp this. God's dream is far greater than anything we could comprehend. But I'm thankful that God is showing me more of it every day. And I want you to appreciate that. God has a dream to bless you in Christ Jesus so that you can become a blessing and bless his glorious name. We are called to be to the praise of his glory. If we're going to be to the praise of his glory, then we've got to elevate our thinking. We've got to set our mind in the heavens, set our hearts in the heavens where Christ is. For where our treasure is, there our heart will be also. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word and thank you for what it's taught us. Please, Lord, help us to see more clearly day by day just how great and how awesome you are. Help us to see more of your dream for us as your children and to appreciate more what you've done for us in Christ Jesus. Thank you for blessing us in Christ Jesus with every spiritual blessing. Help us to become a blessing and to bless your glorious name that we can fulfill our mission in this world and in the spiritual realm among the rulers and authorities to show just how good, how gracious, how kind, and how wise you really are. We praise you, God, for your glorious grace, and we ask you for grace and for forgiveness for all of our sins, for cleansing, that we may be able to continue to, to walk in your ways in a way that brings glory and honor to your name. In Jesus we pray. Amen. You guys normally do an invitation before? Okay. Um, we, Brooklyn is weird. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. So I'm going to do that now. Um, if you're here tonight and you're not yet a Christian, I want to encourage you in that way. I want to encourage you to think about God's dream for you in this world. You may have dreams, you may have hopes, you may have things that you're looking for, that you're chasing after. I can tell you this, there is no greater dream than the one that God has for you. That's a dream to bless you in, in ways that far transcend anything you could ever imagine or accomplish in this world. And to be a child of God is the greatest blessing anyone could ever experience. So if you're here today and you're not yet a Christian, we want to encourage you to turn to Christ, to learn about Christ, to trust in Jesus, to repent of your sins, to be baptized into Christ so that you can die with him and be raised up with him to walk in newness of life. If there's something we can do to help you toward that end, let us know as we stand and sing the last.